Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, FDA and lab developed test in clinical labs. I'm Robert Castellanos of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the C button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh is director of the Mayo Clinic and Doctor in Laboratory he has a focus area of investigation that has broad applicability to the field. Dr. Singh studies the application of liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry to clinical laboratory analysis. Many of the methods that Dr. Singh developed are now considered reference methods. They have subsequently been utilized for method standardization efforts as well as to establish clinical disease correlates which he has published with his collaborators. Dr. Singh has worked directly contributed to improving methods for clinical diagnosis of Cushing's disease, chromatoma, and congenital adrenal hyperplasia. He has continued to work to discover innovative ways to better understand the use of liquid chromatography tendon mass spectrometry in providing patients with faster and more accurate diagnoses. I'll now hand it over to the doctor for his presentation. Thank you, Bobby. I would like to thank uh, Lab Roots for organizing this wonderful event. <clears throat> so the topic, as was announced, is going to be FDA and NASPAC test for clinical labs. And I would also like to thank FDA for sharing some knowledge in the public domain. I would like to start <clears throat> again with the disclosure and disclaimer that this presentation is only for educational purposes and may not represent the view of the FDA and the Mayo Clinic. I had an opportunity to attend a public workshop organized by the FDA on May 2nd in 2016, and title of the workshop was Mass Spectrometry in the Clinic, Regulatory Considerations Surrounding Validation of Liquid Chromatography Mass Spectrometry-Based Devices. On May 2nd, the focus was uh, the use of NASPAC in proteins and peptides, but during some of the sessions, the knowledge was also shared how the NASPAC has impacted the clinical testing in the clinical laboratories. It was very clear during the workshop that mass spectrometry is well known to the FDA, and FDA believes that the mass spec is underutilized for proteins and peptides, and in order to enhance the interactions between the FDA and the clinical mass spec community, they would like to organize more and more educational and communication between the two. And FDA believes communication and collaboration with the clinical mass spectrometry communities can identify the opportunities for FDA to provide help in developing the mass spectrometry-based devices to enhance their entry into the clinic and thus improve the patient care. This particular slide further emphasizes that FDA and their department, which is the Center for Devices of Radiological Health, or the Office of In Vitro Radiological Health, strongly believe that they should communicate with the device manufacturers, sponsors of the various manufacturers, and the people who are uh, intelligent to develop novel technologies. The Center for Medical uh, and Medicaid Services regulate all the laboratory testing performed on humans in the U.S. through the Clinical Lab Improvement Amendment. 
CLIA, which stands for Clinical Lab Improvement Act, approximately governs 254,000 labs now. And again, the purpose is to ensure that most of these labs report quality testing and provide the best clinical testing to the patient care. So the Clinical Lab Improvement Act was passed by the Congress in 1988 and is known as Clinical Lab Improvement Act of 1988. And overall, the purpose of this particular bill was Congress would like to regulate every test in every lab throughout the land, including those in physician's office. FDA was also given responsible to monitor the risk associated with various lab tests and the devices used to perform the various testing. FDA has classified these devices into three categories. Class three is a category which belongs to the device which can have a higher risk or present unreasonable risk of injury or illness or can be life-threatening to the patient. FDA has deeper oversight over this. In comparison, class two devices are with a moderate risk. General controls are not sufficient but can be mitigated through special controls. Class one devices could be waived by the FDA which have low risk for patient care. FDA during the workshop made it a point that they are very straightforward and they would like to help the vendors to get their devices in the market to help the patient either through the pre-market approval process which is for the class three devices or through the 510K approval process which can be followed for the class two devices. When is the 510K required? According to the uh, FDA, any device which needs to be bring into the market after May 28, 1976 has to go through this process. And this particular 510K requirements are listed in the next few slides. And uh, in order to make sure that uh, our mass spec is delivering the quality results, I would like to review how mass spec has come into the clinical labs. So the clinical labs have been using in the past uh, some kind of colorimetric reactions. For example, we used to do colorimetric reactions for steroids, and then we went from steroid metabolites in urine to do it by chromatography. Then we went to using gas chromatography. But then a revolution was there when radio amino acids was discovered and that helped us bringing the testing of the clinical lab into the plasma versus the testing we do in urine. But very soon it was realized that there are some issues with the amino acids. Then it was decided that isotope dilution GCMS can overcome the problems we observe with the amino acids, but it was impractical because of the cost and the talent required to use isotope GCMS in various clinical specialties in the clinical labs. This particular slide further highlights that Dr. Rose and Yellow was given a Nobel Prize for inventing the amino acids which could detect, were sensitive enough to detect the analytes in serum or plasma. This was the era when we could go from urine uh, testing to the plasma testing. Plasma testing could be painful, but it is believed that all the analytes which are in circulation are better representative of the disease than the metabolites in urine. And this was a pretty big revolution in the industry. Then radio amino acids were converted to chemiluminescence amino acids or enzyme like amino acids or fluorescence amino acids or chemiluminescence based sandwich acids. Now in a clinical lab, we don't only have the amino acids, but when the amino acids don't work in real life, we also depend upon the mass spec assays or the chromatography assays, which are listed here. And this is how the labs looked like in 1980s. We used to do manual analysis in serum, then we used to count in a very manual, laborious ways in the scintillation counters and the side effect was we were using a lot of radioactivity. Then our vendors were able to convert those radio amino acids to competitive chemiluminescence based assays which were much easier to automate. And this is how the modern lab looks like, which is very much cleaner than the previous slides you saw. 
and there is a very minimal touch to the patient sample, and the technologists love to work in these labs, and our turnover has decreased. The CLSI is another organization, which is a clinical and laboratory standard institute, also has started providing uh, guidance to the various vendors and to the clinical labs who are trying to develop either the new formats of the old analyze or trying to develop new assays. CLSA is well recognized by the CDR, CDRH or the OIR or branch of the FDA, and they don't believe that they need to reinvent guidelines. Rather, they have endorsed all the clinical guidelines developed by CLSI. For example, I'm showing it here, EPO5A3, EP17A2. And some of the guidelines are very clear from CLSI that we should use the real patient during our development and validation. We should use the samples from the intended population, and we should make sure that we are designing the test. We should cover all the analytical measurement range, and we should also make sure that the test can distinguish between the clinical affected people and the normal people. This particular slide will highlight that the first in the mass spec is increasing over a period of time. If you just notice on this bottom blue bar here, part of the bar here, in comparison to various other technologies, the use of the LC10MS definitely is increasing in the newborn screening, but I would emphasize today that its use is also increasing in other clinical specialties also. FDA proactively has provided guidance to the industry, and here is an example where they have a class two special control guidance document for newborn screening test system for amino acids, precarnitine, and acylcarnitine using tandem mass spectrometry. Like I was saying that the mass spec is not only used for biochemical genetics or inborn or after of metabolisms for amino acid or carnitines, rather it is also used for uh, steroids and catecholamines and uh, other molecular genetics. Here is an example here if the testing for a patient which you see on the slide here has Cushing's and this patient looks like Cushing's but this patient resembles very much uh, with the people in the US population who is obese and has a hypertension but if we miss this patient who has a tumor either in the brain or the adrenal gland, then this patient can die versus if we perform the cortisol testing by mass spec, when then we can save the life of this patient and this patient can return back what she used to look like before she had developed the disease. So let's talk a little bit about the issues we have with the cortisol testing. So there are some issues with the amino assay and that is the reason the clinicians do call the lab that when they don't believe the result is correct, they would like the lab to repeat the testing with HPLC UV methodology, which also has some issues. Then ultimately, we have to do the testing by using LCMS. And this is the list of various uh, compounds which can cross-react with the antibodies used in these amino acids. And those particular analytes are highlighted with the circles here. And you can notice here that the prednisolone has a cross reactivity with the antibody, which is developed for cortisol, but it can also cross react with the prednisolone, and it can also cross react with a 6-methyl six, six prednisolone by 21%. And some of the other precursors of cortisols also do cross react. So what this means is that antibody used for the amino acid can have overestimation of the cortisol result, which can provide false positive results. And this is also clear from this comparison that if you notice here the method comparison by using tandem aspect and using the amino acid is far from perfect. It only lacks, it not only lacks the slope, that means mass spec only provides one third of the volume values, but it also lacks the correlation, that there is no good correlation between the two methodologies, 
and also the amount of cortisol present in the serum is one third of the value, approximately the value which is obtained by the amino assay. So that means antibody used in the assay probably has a cross reactivity with the cortisol metabolites, and it is well known now that it significantly cross reacts with the cortisone, which is one of the major metabolites. This is an example here. If you take the same sample from the patient which had a uh, cross reactivity with the cortisone or prednisolone, you run an HPLC, you can separate those two peaks, but even in the HPLC method, there are some drug interferences where you don't resolve these peaks very much, and the technologists not only have to work whole day to process these samples, but then in the end, they may not be satisfied with the quality of the results which are obtained by the HPLC UV. Then in the end, the labs have to run the same sample by using LCMS. If you compare the previous chromatogram with this particular one, you notice this has much cleaner chromatogram and it has a cortisol and cortisol uh, peak separate and we don't see any uh, interference because of the other drugs or the prednisone prednisolone. But what you notice here is still this method runs for almost more than 20 minutes. It requires half day of extraction. With the invention of liquid chromatography tendon mass spec, we are able to do this testing much faster. This slide highlights that clinicians are wondering why even we are performing the urine cortisol assays by using amino acids. So thus at Mayo Clinic, we have switched the cortisol assays to the liquid chromatography tandem aspect where not only we can separate cortisol from cortisone, but we can also maintain this pre-analytical process by using the internal standard. And as you all, all already are noticing, the turnaround time or the run time of this particular assay is also very short that in two minutes you can get results compared to the 20 minutes used in a single LCMS. So we also have some problems with the testosterone amino acids, especially in women. As you notice here, the structure of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone is very similar. And if the antibody was raised against testosterone or dihydrotestosterone, they can cross react with each other. And here is the list provided by the manufacturer or by the investigators that the antibody against testosterone does have a cross reactivity with methyl testosterone up to 12.2% and some other drugs up to 6.7%. The even though the cross reactivity is in the range of 6 to 12%, but the doses of these drugs or the synthetic testosterone used is in much higher concentration that it can result into very high value for falsely high value for testosterone in patient sample. <clears throat> this was the editorial published in Clinical Chemistry, which I'm going to zoom in, which kind of questions that out of the various amino acids, none of those acids were as good as the gas chromatography GCMS, which is considered to be a gold standard method but the GCMS sense is impractical for most of the endocrine labs because it is laborious and most of the GCMS work now can be performed on LCMSMS and that is what has happened in real life in various clinical labs. This is another example here where the testosterone by the amino acids, especially in women is also impacted by the levels of SHBG. SHBG values do go high in pregnancy or the woman with the uh, uh, on out, uh, oral contraceptives. And because the SHBG high is high, the amount of testosterone recovered in the total testosterone acid by the amino acid is not very consistent or precise. And this is one manufacturer on the left and on the right. The manufacturer may have less bias, but still there is a lot of variability where you cannot predict which patient will have good recovery of testosterone when there is a change in the SFBG concentration. There's a lot of literature like this available where the testosterone values have been questioned in women and in children. The similar issues we have seen for vitamin D. Vitamin D is a very hot topic and can collapse because its association has been uh, or its clinical use has been found to be in malabsorption, uh, effect of the 
various medications, its role in uh, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, and other diseases. This particular uh, uh, highlights that normal source of vitamin D is sun, but because of the concern with the uh, skin cancer, most of the people are using vitamin D supplements, and those supplements can be vitamin D or D2. Both forms of vitamin D will go to the liver and will get converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D, then which will get converted to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is a bioactive hormone. But this bioactive hormone changes with the calcium intake, is does not consider as a good biomarker to monitor the nutritional level of vitamin D. So the 25 hydroxy vitamin D is considered to be the biomarker if you are interested in determining the uh, nutrition level of vitamin D as the vitamin D which is ingested quickly gets converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So various manufacturers have very quickly developed the 25 hydroxy vitamin D assays and those assays have been cleared by FDA through the 510K process. But unfortunately, when you compare those assays with the gold standard HPLC and MES method, it is uh, seen that those assays not only provide less precision, less accuracy, but they are not also clinically consistent. And in this particular paper, it was highlighted that both radio amino acids and chemiluminescence amino acid seem to overestimate the vitamin D deficiency in general population, what you will get uh, compared to by using HPLC method, either by UV method and um, by MS method. So this could be concerning because a lot of people may be overtaking vitamin D. So this particular example further highlights if HPLC or LCMSMS method is the gold standard, then we should work together to help the vendors who are making the amino acids to help in standardizing and work under the umbrella of FDA to provide better quality of the testing for patient care. Our endocrine colleagues also are very conscious of the problems we have with the amino acids, and they are reminding us that the lab, especially the clinical labs, should not only provide the proficiency testing, which is provided to the cab, but that proficiency testing should be run in a manner which is accurate and precise, and the procedure only is good enough, not good enough, according to the American Endocrine Society. And this is the cartoon which highlights what accuracy means, that you are at the target, you know that center is centered, and that is the accurate value for testosterone, vitamin D, or other compounds. And then hopefully all the clinical labs and all the vendors could nail it down and get the accurate values. Most of the vendors who provide automation solutions do provide great precision, and that precision sometimes is even difficult when we are doing manual ELISAs or manual LCMSMS assays. So we need to take advantage of the automation and the LCMSMS so that we can provide accuracy and precision. So when I look at my menu of the testing we offer in a clinical lab, menu gets divided into two big classes. One we call a small molecular weight, one we call it large molecular weight. And this example will help you in illustrating that the amino acids belong to the small molecular weight may have some issues, but those issues are much less when it comes to the high molecular weight proteins. And this particular example highlights that because of the small molecular weight of cortisol, testosterone, and vitamin D, you can use only one antibody, and then you have to use a labeled analyte, which is called a competition. And when you provide a competition configuration of the assay, then your signal to noise or the signal will depend inversely proportional to the concentration of the analyte. And when the signal is inversely proportional to the concentration of the analyte, that means uh, it has a uh, inverse line here, but because of the limited antibody and the limited tracer, the other disadvantage is that the signal is almost plateauing at the low concentration or at the high concentration. 
that means the precision of the amino acid is also not good, either at the low concentration or at the high concentration. And it also has a very limited dynamic range. In comparison, when it comes to the large molecular weight proteins, we can use two different antibodies. Antibody, one antibody will capture the antigen or the analyte. Then we can turn the magnet on or the solid phase photon. We can wash all the matrix proteins like albumins and aminoglobulins and clean up all the reaction cell. Then we bring in a second antibody, which has a label on it. Then the second antibody will only bind to the antigen, which is a large molecule with protein. Then we can uh, provide a chemiluminous signal by adding hydrogen peroxide or providing other chemistries. Then that means the signal will be directly proportional to the concentration. So these sandwich acids are amazing. Then they work on the amino acids, uh, automated waveforms. They provide great linearity, great accuracy, and great precision. And this is what is exploited in the clinical labs. Clinical labs are providing millions of assays uh, results to the physicians throughout the U.S. and throughout the world. And we are really, really in a good position where all these labs are doing a wonderful job and good results are being provided by using a mixture of multiple technologies. For some of the analytes where the amino acids don't work, we had to use LCMSMS, and in the big reference lab, the number of mass specs are being used, and you, they get situated right next to each other in front of every mass spec. You have to use so, liquid chromatography, and even before you do liquid chromatography, you would also have to prepare the sample to clean up as much as your assay would require based upon your sensitivity and specificity requirements for the clinical assay. When you are developing your own assays in the lab, you do have CLSA guideline, which clearly says that it is the responsibility of the vendor to make sure the assay has a good precision, uh, good intra-assay precision, good intra-assay precision. It has a good method comparison with a gold standard method. It is a linear. It has a good reportable range. It has a good method comparison, and it has a good population studied the Z population and the reference range population so that it can separate the two populations. And the analytical sensitivity and specificity of the clinical labs are supposed to confirm even when they buy the test from the vendors which have been FDA cleared or approved to just to confirm that what is on the label actually works in real life. And some of the mass spec companies are working very hard to bring a solution which will take an advantage of the automation to improve the precision and to have some kind of mass spec detector added to the box so that it can provide the specific result. So the precision will come from the automation and the specificity will come from the mass spec and that will be the best of the two worlds. So if we buy mass spec, uh, uh, only for which is sold as an R&D device according to FDA, that will be class one and should be only for R&D purposes. But if we start using a reagent from a manufacturer who will also sell the instrument, then according to the FDA, this becomes a system and would have to go through the FDA clearance process. And according to the uh, FDA 510K process, depends upon class one or class two. Class one most of the time is exempt. Class two is based upon its equivalence on the predicate device. And FDA has a very clear definition of predicate device. And I will encourage the listeners to go to the FDA site and get those clarifications. FDA we'll have a very quick review of this and we'll get back to you in 19-day review process. FDA, uh, Julie was our host when we attended this workshop and she has also, along with her colleagues, have published a very nice paper here in the clinical chemistry which shares FDA experience with the clinical mass spectrometry. And in this paper, they are highlighting that how in recent years they have been 
able to clear through 510k process three different devices. The first device was HPLC 10MS back acid for tracheal limits, and the second was HPLC 10MS back for newborn screening. And third, which one is a very modern application of the mass pack in the shape and form of a multi-top for the microbiome identification. And that was another revolution in the microbiology, how quickly the microbiology or microbiologists have adopted the mass pack to improve the patient care. And this is an example here where the various vendors who got this approval, what kind of data they submitted to the FDA and what was the uh, reviewing process by the FDA. So everything is presented in this clinical chemistry paper, and I would like to encourage you to go through this paper as well. And in the end, FDA gives this letter, and as you can imagine, this is a very uh, big deal for a vendor or a lab when you get a clearance from FDA, and it uh, looks like FDA has a workflow in place to give these clearances for LCMS MS devices as well. And this is another example here where Waters got uh, clearance for their immunosuppressant kit, and some of their data included uh, comparison with the predicate device one and predicate device two, and it is listed what are the advantages of the mass spec assays or its equivalency of that assays. And it also lists what are the differences between the two assays so everything is very transparent. The vendor did a good job. FDA reviewed it, and in the end, medical community was able to uh, make use of a FDA clear test, which is based upon the mass spec, which provides all the advantages of the amino acids in terms of the automation and precision, and it also provides the specificity as well. And this is the way, if you go to the FDA website, you can look at the information, what was submitted then to the FDA if you are new in this area of the business. Everything is available in the public domain. The particular workshop which FDA had called was to prepare the future users which are working in the areas of metabolomics and proteomics, and they have a very good handle on the folks who are working in genomics, especially in the next gen sequencing but the community they brought together was people who are developing cancer biomarkers or developing new database microbiology or our colleagues in anatomic pathologies who are using more and more mass spec, for example, in amyloid uh, typing and other diseases. And uh, Dr. Dobry Nettlecoff from Arizona State University was kind enough to share with our workshop attendees that there are very few tests which are using LCMSMS uh, in the class of high molecular weight proteins and peptides. And the reason, that, as I said before, is probably because we don't have as many issues with the proteins and peptides because we are using sandwich assays. But now as we are discovering novel biomarkers, or uh, there may be interest in rediscovering some of the isoforms of the various uh, well-known proteins, and we can uh, take an advantage of LCMSMS in those areas as well. But FDA would like that to work with the vendors so that because the, some of the reagents and trypsin being used is something novel, which we don't use in the LCMSMS for small molecular weight, and that can affect the quality of the testing, and FDA would proactively like to provide a guidance to the vendors in the lab so that the process gets done smoothly. And some of those reagents are listed here. Uh, mass spec HPLC in the sample prep probably is the same for all the mass spec assays, but the trypsin and the antibodies will be unique to be used for the proteins and peptides. And that's where FDA would like to proactively understand and uh, work with the vendors to look at the limitations of these reagents. FDA was also very clear uh, in this particular workshop that for low to moderate risk device where there is no predicate, you still can go to the FDA and they will help you to decide if the device is ready for clinical use and is safe. And this particular de novo device 
can take up to 120 days, a little bit longer than what it takes for 510K. And the class three devices are very serious for everybody, for general public, for clinical labs, for the vendors, and generally it requires more time. But um, more communication with FDA, the better outcome. And this process will take longer because it will require multiple levels of meetings with the advisory panels at different layers of FDA uh, uh, communication in their office. FDA also presented a very good case study to encourage the intellectuals and other developers of the assays that how they can start thinking about this process when you're developing a new LCMS MS assay for a new cancer marker where there is no predicate device. An example here is that Acme Diagnostic is developing a novel peptide-based LCMS quantitative in vitro diagnostic device for the detection of spider protein. Of course, this is a joke. And it is an aid to diagnosis of Webb syndrome. Again, another sense of humor there. And this company would like input from FDA on validation, intended use, and other questions in a face-to-face -face meeting. And the, one of the questions is, uh, that sponsor is asking is that we propose the following predicate. A rebel diagnostic has a spider ELISA. Does FDA agree with this predicate? And FDA answer could be in such a situation, the choice of the predicate is up to the sponsor, whether you want to propose that this is a predicate device and the use is similar and the principles are the similar. However, we know, according to the FDA, that the predicate you have selected was cleared in 1992. Since that time, understanding of the biology of the disease has progressed and regulatory practice has evolved. We strongly suggest that you consult publicly available decision summaries on the website for the most current regulatory expectation. The second question by the sponsor is that we propose to test 250 patients, 500 normal healthy controls in our clinical study. Does FDA agree with this proposal? FDA answer in this case would be no, we do not agree. You have proposed including normal healthy subjects in your study. However, these subjects are not part of the intended clinical population and therefore testing your device with these subjects will not present an accurate reflection of your device specificity. You should also test subjects with a condition with the intended user population to determine sensitivity specificity positive predictive value, negative predictive value of your device. We note that you're performing reference range and they really appreciate that is also essential and they do comment that vendor has taken a proactive approach to determine that reference range as well. Vendor is asking another question. We propose testing agreement with the predicate using a two into two concordance table because the predicate is a qualitative device versus quantitative. Does FDA agree with this proposal? And FDA politely would say, yes, we agree that. In this case, comparing the performance of your device to that of predicate by concordance would be appropriate. So in summary, the FDA has opened a lot of channels and doors for people who are in the clinical diagnostic business, whether we are vendors, whether we are labs, helping the patient care and the clinicians, and there is a process called Q submission where there is no penalty in starting this negotiation. This will have no uh, negative impact um, on your final outcome of a proposal. This is a way of only starting your conversation and then getting some guidance to the best FDA can based upon their pre previous. But I don't see any negative in that. I think this will help in making the product better and safe for the patient care. So my conclusion is that when I was there, I got really impressed and got educated. FDA believes that we should talk to them and they don't have intention of developing new guidelines. Most of us in the clinical lab business are very well aware of the CLS guidelines and we should take full advantage of those and help in designing our new assays. And uh, analytical performance testing is clear, uh, uh, critical for the clearance of the approval of the LCMS-MS devices. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, Bobby. Thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We're going to try to answer as many questions as time is allow. Doctor, our first question is, what are the limitations of the mass spec? Thanks, Bobby. Uh, great question. So mass spec is relatively a new technique for the clinical labs compared to the amino acids which we have been using in the clinical labs. And as I indicated, uh, the pre-analytical process is a little laborious for mass spec testing. In addition, clinical labs have been using amino acids for decades. So we know the limitations, advantages, and disadvantages. But the mass spec is relatively new to us. So we would have to uh, understand what are the disadvantages, and that will come with period of time and experience. The other is that we may have to define new reference ranges because we have old reference ranges based upon the amino acids. One concern also comes in a specialty like mine when we are testing in pediatric population that we don't have enough sample to work with and sample requirement for LCM, SMS, uh, maybe much more than the amino acids. Thanks, Bobby. Our next question, what is the role of CAP and how does that differ from FDA? FDA is a public and government body and uh, was given a responsibility and does have a legal power as well to regulate the labs and regulate the manufacturers. In reality, so far, most of the vendors, before they bring their devices to the market, have been working with the FDA and only the labs which were working with the clinical trials were involved with the FDA, but uh, the labs which are purely performing the clinical lab testing were only had a working relationship with College of American of Pathologist or CAP. So College of American of Pathologist is a nonprofit organization and is a group of professionals where they have a great mission to help them maintain the quality of the testing in the clinical lab. And CAP has a great history and it does go and provides the inspection, and it is considered as a peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, but I would say it doesn't have that legal, what I know so far, it is an autonomous body and a nonprofit organization. And it's very unclear that how these two bodies like FDA and CAP will work um, so that the labs and the vendors are legally compliant. Thank you, Ali. And we do have time for one last question. Uh, does this have any impact on human research? It's a question here again. Now, what my understanding is that uh, FDA would like to use more and more use of mass spec to discover new biomarkers in the area of the proteomics, even in genomics. But since the expectations and the role of the public involvement is incre increasing, FDA would like that all those studies are done in humans and they're done in a very good uh, CLSI guidelines manner so that if we discover some biomarker which is going to go to the clinical trial, that it has been designed and validated uh, really according to the best guidelines so that we don't have to uh, withdraw the product from the market. So we all are very cautious about it. So the more we could do upfront research work under the best guidelines 
I think we all will be win-win in the end. Thank you. And to wrap up today, Doctor, do you have any final comments for your presentation before we let you go? So um, I think I enjoyed uh, this presentation and um, I would encourage that a lot is happening in the area of lab diagnostics because we are discovering some new biomarkers or we are using some testing which has not been FDA cleared. And as long as we stay in communication and we use the best technology for the patient care, and uh, I think it's a time and period where the communication has a lot of uh, value and we can learn from each other and we can help each other out. And in the end, we all will feel proud that we have helped the patient and we all will feel good about it. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Singh again for his outstanding presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February of 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.